All right. Okay. So now the floor is yours. So I, I think you don't see any any other message. So please. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, guys. My name is Rachel Sinclair. Um, I'm with the company Simuli, and uh, today I just kind of want to introduce. I'm going to be quite brief, not very technical talk. It's really an invitation to collaborate. So uh, Simuli was started as a fabulous design company who is trying to accelerate AGI or artificial general intelligence. If you want to extend your vacation out here in Sweden, there's actually the AGI conference in Stockholm tomorrow through the 19th. So if you haven't been conferenced out by the end of this one, just jump over to Stockholm. Um, we'll be doing a workshop there too as well. But uh, so, so our, our whole passion and goal at Simuli is artificial general intelligence. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on is a hyper vector HTC VSA kind of general purpose accelerator for hyper vector mathematics. And that is partially in aid of the community. And that is partially of you guys here, which is why the invitation to collaborate. And it is also partially selfishly for Simulai's own goals for AGI architecture relies on some elements of HTC not just HGC though. So today I'm just gonna be talking about the chip, which we've very cleverly or not so much named NDPU, the Nonlinear Decentralized Processing Unit, or very mouthful for the name of a chip. Um, and there's some other people, let me see. There's some other people involved in this, if you know Ben Gertzel from SingularityNet on the AGI front, but I said, who was involved in the Memrister project, so that there's more people in, involved in here. And then of course we have some people working with us in the audience like Peter and other folks, quasi Adam here, yeah, quasi related. Um, but ideally, although I said the motivation for this new NDPU chip is AGI based, there's kind of a greater discussion that hasn't really been worked into the community on how powerful hypervector computing is. And so we really want to push the boundaries on what's possible. So if you think about how we're getting performance increases in hardware today, it's mostly based on miniaturization. So how do you make transistors smaller, which is Kylie pointed out um, is a dying trend in which we're quickly approaching a brick wall for. And then the other methods are how do we increase our parallel processing? Or how do we make these accelerators that are just edge devices, right? And so our approach and kind of this, I'm using the term HDC as a blanket term. So forgive me, because I know this is, is not so proper for you guys. Um, but can you can we can we look at this problem in a different way to say, can we just make the transistors work harder? Right? Don't change anything about the lower level, don't change anything about this or that. Just make things work harder. Um Kind of the idea for this is is more of a load compute store method, right? So it's it's antithetical to the John von Neumann approach. What you really want to do is you want things to live on the chip, and in order to do that, you want them to live in a very compressed form. Otherwise, it's very expensive, as, as Kylie pointed out, right? Um, so the applications of this are greater than just artificial intelligence, which is where we're trying to push the boundaries. And I know there's a lot of research that needs to go in to make this stuff realizable. Um, but you take something like hyperscale computing. So if you take database operations, data sharding, this, you know, petabytes of data that we're entering right now, if we can use HTC or VSA or any sort of hyper vector computing, what you get is able to compute in a compressed form. So if you could take every database, every piece of information, compress it, and then compute in that compressed form, that extends our performance of computing without having to radically rely on, you know, any sort of miniaturization of hardware or just parallel processing alone. You get all of these things in addition to hypervector computing. Of course, artificial intelligence, you guys understand that. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to motivate why you want HDC or VSA for AI stuff. And then there's another interesting aspect which isn't widely talked about, which is security. So hypervectors have a natural security to them or security is a poor word for cryptographers and mathematicians here, but a natural immunity, which I'll, I'll briefly cover. Um, so these are kind of the three umbrella sectors of computing 
And since we know that hypervector mathematics is functionally complete, that means in theory that you can build a new computing architecture and framework out of this mathematics. How far are we away from that? Quite far, as you guys pretty well know. Uh, but that is kind of part of the push today is to invite people to kind of expand and push the boundaries on what we can do with this stuff. Um, so our NDPU chip, and there's, you know, we're not the first at this HDC accelerator, right? There's tons of people, uh, tons of different ways that you can approach this problem. But kind of the core principles that we're looking at is fixed point architecture. So there's a there's a large story that I would love to tell, but don't have the time for here on why floating point operations is uh, led us astray in terms of computing architectures. We really just want to return to Boolean fixed point architectures. We also want things like processing and memory. Uh, so we're personally looking at things like magnetic tunnel junctions, but there's many other approaches to this. The simplest being like a Pinotubo architecture, which I'm probably saying wrong, uh, the JJs. But there's a bunch of different ways to approach processing and memory. Um, phase change memory is something else that we're looking very seriously at. Um, and the advantages that you get of having this, what we call near memory or processing in memory, along with your FIOPs, your fixed point architectures, uh, is that you're highly low power, right? Which is very good for internet of things, very good for large federated learning, stuff like that. Uh, and then also you, you get almost this maximum level of auto vectorization, right? So you, you get to exploit the natural parallelism that happens in hypervector mathematics. Uh, so this is kind of where the display of, of AI chips versus something like the NDPU falls. And, and there's many other chips that aren't put on here, right? I just want to make that clear. Um, but I do want to pause for one second to some information that's not explicitly written. So along with trying to create our own hardware architecture, uh, we're also working on some compiler implementations to get some of the common HDC frameworks like Torch HD and, and Py, uh, BHV, uh, saying it wrong, but some different stuff to work on existing chips like GraphCore's IPUs, Cerebras, uh, they have their own chip systems. We've been working with these other companies to say, not just GPU acceleration, there's other stif stuff that's already on the market. Can we, can, are hypervector is more suited for those emerging chips as well, right? So that, that's a, a question to explore. Um, and we've been in those conversations. So in terms of AI computation, our approach, Simulize approach to how this works, is directly related to the auto-associative properties of hypervectors. Um, just to kind of give a, a brief taste on our own flavor of AI with hypervectors, there's a researcher at the Australian National University. Um, his name is Andrew Coward, and he's come up with a theoretical framework for understanding higher cognition in terms of anatomy and physi physiology. Oh, it's a mouthful, uh, but it's a bunch of neuroscience stuff. And we subscribe to that framework and Basically, in order to make that framework, one of the practical implementations you can use is hypervectors. So that is our kind of long-term AI approach. There's many other approaches, right? But that's our flavor. If you're interested about that, it's my favorite thing to talk about. So I'd love to talk about it, you know, offline or anything. Um, but yeah, so kind of you guys all know this, but I think one of the, the things that helps me remember you know, why would you even think about new hardware in the first place? So if you take something like this unicorn picture, right, which is just a PNG image, uh, that lives in three channels, rows, columns, color channels, plus an alpha. And the number of uh, floating point or kind of binary representation of this in a 64-bit floating point space is 11.8 million bits. And when you convert this to a single hypervector, you have 10,000 bits. So obviously this is very good, um, but utilizing this properly in hardware calls for a redesign or, or, or rethink of how we're going to shuffle these bits around, right? Because typically you can split up this 11.8 million in a GPU across SIMD, but really we want sort of an MIMD architecture, right? Which is why we've looked at something like GraphCore's IPUs or, or redesigning our own architecture. Um, 
So I have no idea how I'm doing on time here, but okay. So now I'm getting to this point of this uh, natural immunity, right? And so these are some very back of the envelope calculations. Um, but basically, if you take that same picture of the unicorn on the last slide, and you kind of use the uh, pure mute XOR approach to encoding that into a hypervector, and then you do some kind of extra XOR encryption based protocols, which is you know a research research kind of field of XOR encryption, you end up having this situation uh, where it would take quite many qubits to be able to extract that that exact image. Uh, assuming that you don't have some of the method methodology that led to encoding that image as a hypervector. So hypervectors have this natural immunity, which makes them very good for some sorts of communication and government protocols and things like that. But it's not it's not post-quantum secure by any means. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there is a natural immunity, um, which makes it very useful. Uh, but there's some interesting discussion on how to push that immunity into something like full encryption that would be post-quantum secure, right? So I'm just raising a lot of questions for you guys to say, hey, someone should figure this out, right? Um, but our overall goal with this NDPU chip is to increase the accuracy and interpretation in computing. And so I wanna pause on this slide, which is overly simplified and kind of just talk for a couple minutes about what we're really trying to do here. So back in the day, when we first got started with computing, we had analog computers, right? Um, and then we switched that for digital computers when Alan Turing and John von Neumann came up with this electronic digital computer. And we all of that started with just regular Boolean expressions. And then we introduced this floating point nonsense and blah, 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 um, which I know is a large statement. But um, but basically, what, what we're kind of saying is, We've made this transition from analog to digital, and now these analog digital hybrids. And these hybrids are really just conversions between analog and digital, depending on what you need. So RAM is, is based on analog principles, which is in almost every modern computer. So every modern computer is some sort of analog digital hybrid. But what we have an opportunity to do here with hypervector computing is something like a true analog digital hybrid, where you get the information capacity of an analog signal, which is the dimensionality of your hypervector, right? Is how much capacity you have to contain a signal before it gets saturated. Um, but you also have the precision of digital computing, which you're able to tease out by this kind of statistical thresholding interpretation of Hamming distance, cosine similarity, all this stuff. So you get this, this almost more true analog digital hybrid. Um, and that's why we've been looking at something like magnetic tunnel junctions, because before the transistor, there was vacuum tubes, right? And an MTJ, at least the voltage controlled MTJs, if you want to look them up on Wikipedia or whatever, they, they're almost like true electric vacuum tubes. Um, so they're, I'd say they're less like transistors than they are like vacuum tubes, but they're electric based. So it's kind of it's kind of this interesting, interesting um, space to be in. And I think what's really useful about about this true analog digital hybrid is you get something that's pseudo quantum, right? So, so you get this mathematical system and software that's supported by some sort of somewhat optimized hardware that will hopefully get more optimized as the years go that almost self assembles and self organizes into sorting information into a correct attractor state, right? Which is essentially what's going on in quantum computing. Um, which is very useful for a lot of very complex problems like can be hard problems, some AI problems. Um, but you can also use it for stuff like database processing. Now, in order to do some of the database processing stuff, the field of what we're all here for today needs to answer some questions like how do you add one plus one and get two in hypervector space, right? There's some very core primitives that haven't been explored that would really open up this as a found foundational like computer architecture rather than an AI framework. Um, but that's something that we're interested in. And of course, this serves the purpose of reducing computing cost or scaling cost in general. So if, we're, if you do the calculations as other people have, not just myself, 
there's about nine years of Moore's law left before we get to the size of a single phosphorus atom. Uh, there's single atom computers or transistors already, right? That came out in like 2012 or 2007, 2004, the iterations of those. Um, and so in order to kind of bridge the gap between whatever we're gonna do after we decide we're done with transistors and what we have now, I think something like uh, foundational HDC VSA hypervector mathematic approach might be useful to help bridge that gap. Not the only way, there's DNA computing, there's other types of computing, all sorts of crazy stuff. But for practical purposes right now, what's really useful is this increased throughput and speed, right? Why do you need hardware? Why can't we just use CPUs? Um, is because it's slow. It's very slow. So we ran some early tests. These are very primitive tests, right? Nothing like uh, Kylie's wonderful experiments or probably some other people that will show their stuff. These are very primitive. How do you just get data into a hypervector test? Not how do you compute in hypervector space? So there's a data sharding test. How do you split data up? If you compress data, which is at the heart of everything we're saying here, is that you can if you can compress data and then compute in a compressed form, then everything you do after that will have performance benefits, assuming your hardware doesn't mess up the uh, the benefits that you're getting from the compression. And then how do you do some sort of comparison, like compare four images? Are these two images like those two images in that database? Very basic stuff, right? Um, and just on FPGA, if I'll go to the next slide, if my computer can manage this. Okay, so just in our FPGA, just based on regular RTL, nothing fancy, no PIM, no fixed architecture. Uh, you get massive memory reduction, reduction in CPU, which I'll explain in a second, and massive reduction of power. And this, this can be widely improved. There's no parallelization, there's no optimization. This is kind of worst case scenario if you just, did a really bad job <laughs> building this thing. This is as bad as it would be. Um, CPU CPU usage basically indicates that like if, if you had another functional chip or an ASIC or PCIe, some sort of other thing, how much more could you do with your CPU on the motherboard if you offloaded these computes to your dedicated device, right? So it's you can it's very promising, um, but yet it's very slow, right? And when you upscale these estimations to an ASIC, so this was those were on FPGA. So if you use the, the normal, what happens when you convert from FPGA to ASIC and change the uh, nanometer technology, processing technology, uh, what do you expect to gain? So you get massive speed up at that point, right? Uh, but again, these are these are very early, early tests. So I think. The reason for wanting to rush this academic work straight into industry uh, hits on kind of challenge two that we were presented with today, is that when you push things to industry, you rapidly have to kind of grapple and accelerate at you know developing this technology for practical use. And I think this stuff has so much practical applications and a huge impact and ability to grow, right? It's not just single pointed impact. It's not just edge devices. It's not just YOLO from deep learning being applied to like the same 400 problems. Um, it's a foundational impact that can really scale as we grow. Um, so I kind of want to invite everyone to help collaborate because in part, we want to build this chip for you guys to say, hey, how can we make this useful for the research community to continuously grow out the abilities of hypervector mathematics, right? Um, and there will, also, there will also be some like point in case applications where with very tricky compiler work, you say plug and play this chip in the industry. But then of course for you guys, there's some more dedicated underpinning stuff. So that relies on bringing kind of the field together and creating very kind of standardized protocols for how do we do this computing space, which I think is useful for everyone. So thanks for listening guys. And, and I'm hoping we can, we can collaborate further. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
stuff I do and then have some hard ideas and then I have a back of us trying. Yeah, that's about right. So I think I'm just gonna stand up because I can't see you. Um yeah, so I think kind of what uh, our approach has been is to lead with software. Um and traditionally what happens, you know, this is uh, my opinion, right, based on the research and the direction that I've seen happen in the field, is that software doesn't tend to make radical shifts in innovation unless they're absolutely forced to. And when they're forced to, they're ultimately bound by the constraints of the hardware. So hardware is even slower in making radical innovation shifts because uh, until the software says we're at our upper bounded limit, Hardware typically says, well, you know, we'll get to it eventually, right? We're, we're not very preemptive in optimization is what I'm trying to say, right? Normally when we're, we're stuck with the cold, cold hard problem is, is when we change. So a lot of what Simula is doing is software based, uh, but with the foundation that we can collect a core RTL base, which will turn into this general purpose architecture. And in general purpose will not be all encompassing, right? You can't do everything on a GPU, but a GPU is not meant for one single AI model, right? So that's what I mean by, by general purpose. So, so you're absolutely right. We're not redesigning material science. We're not redesigning, uh, you know, the core like underlying stuff that's going on. We're just using kind of best, most timely implementations to put a solution together to start building a framework on top of. We're very early. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, so we're, we're very early, right? This is very early startup. Um, and that's why I'm inviting everyone to collaborate because we want to make sure that it's not single pointedly developed for whatever I personally want to use it for, right? Um, but we we definitely want a load compute store me methodology. So we need non-volatile memory, which is why we want processing and memory. Phase change memory is very popular. Intel has been working on a HDC phase change memory chip for a while, which most people that are working on it don't think will really see the light of day, although that's a matter of opinion. Um, we, we really like this fixed point architecture because you get to strip out all the overhead of needing floating point stuff, although that makes your compiler work way more intensive. Uh, so there's all these things to balance. Um, but yeah, I think the, the key is load compute store or load store compute. Might be getting that one. So awesome talk. Uh, but are you guys looking to develop just kind of this processor or are you looking to develop kind of like a new, it sounds like you're trying to develop a new like approach to computing. I won't really say like logic family, but it sounds <laughs> like definitely um, a, a new tech, like, it's architecture. Okay. Yeah, like if you think about volume and architectures, which is like basically all we have, um, what I'm kind of saying is that I think HDC or VS, again, I'm, I should be yelled at. I'm using HDC as a blanket term, but hypervector mathematics, I personally believe, is a foundation powerful enough to create an alternative architecture than volume of computing. Is that Simulize's main goal? No, our goal is to accelerate AGI. That's our goal. We, we build other processors uh, like um, in collaboration with another company, True AGI, their MPMC chip, which is more at the AGI conference or whatever. Uh, and we have our own AGI frameworks, which we care more about. Uh, but I'm kind of just raising the interesting question of like, could we push in that direction? So. My hope is that our NDP will push in that direction. Will it get all the way there? I, I doubt it, right? I mean, I've only looked five, 10 years into the future for this. I haven't planned past that. So, but yeah, great question. Thanks. Uh, maybe a short question. <clears throat> yeah, like, well, when you talk about general purpose computes and like high, high utilization, like to me, that's like kind of uh, like how do you marry those in, in the agency? Yeah, I think it's it's um everything is going to be suboptimal when you're combining general purpose and high 
performance, like you said, right? But I think it's pushing the needle in a better direction than what we have now, right? And that's kind of my point on this new framework that's not von Neumann framework based on hypervector mathematics. Um, it's general purpose in the sense that theoretically you could do things like database processing, not just AI. Theoretically, you too could do things like cryptography, anything, right? It's functionally complete. Um, how much research needs to happen in order to make that a reality is quite a lot. So I don't, I think that is the goal. I don't think that is the stepping stone path. But yeah, thanks. So thank you guys. I think. Yeah, thank you, Rich. I think that's really good.